Thank you. Welcome, everyone. So tonight's event is our popular Bronco Expert Series. We have these sessions monthly, and we bring experts and really anyone from our alumni community to share a wealth of knowledge and opportunities with other Broncos, friends, and family. And so tonight, we have some family members as well from what I saw on the screen. Welcome, everyone. And this is our third year into the Bronco Expert Series. They started throughout our first phase of the pandemic, is what I'll call it. And we've continued until now. We realized that this is an opportunity for a lot of folks to reconnect and you know, see each other, but also meet and greet and new stories. So this is a really great opportunity for all of us to learn. And I'm really excited to be continuing with Ricardo tonight. And Ricardo Cortes is a San Jose native and the 2022 Creative Ambassador by the City of San Jose, where he has hosted workshops for students with the intersections of STEAM, technology, and lowrider culture, which he'll dive deeper in tonight. From his time as a student, Ricardo began studying engineering and found the art department at SEU, which has continued to lead him to a path of artistic expression ever since. He is involved now with the United Lowrider Council of San Jose. He is also in the illustration phase. I hope I can disclose that. <laughs> the illustration phase of writing a children's book that will be ready in a few months or so. So we'll have him back for another Bronco Expert series once his book is ready. So keep an eye out for that. And currently he is the director of marketing at Santa Clara University's Miller Center for Social Entrepreneurship. So if you recognize his face, he might have been around campus at another event or another area, but he is a super Bronco, as we like to call ourselves for our alumni and now staff members at the university. And with, well, with us tonight again, Ricardo, it's a pleasure to have you here. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Well, right now we'll start with your presentation. Okay. And like I mentioned, for those or guests that are still joining us. We'll have a Q&A at the end, but if you do have questions, make sure to add them in the chat for us. All right, great. Let's start with your presentation. I'm going to share my screen for everyone. All right. Great. Okay. Yeah. Well, thanks for having me, everybody. It's uh, an honor and a pleasure to be here. Uh, so today I'll be talking about how I've intersected my career and my journey through art as a way of preserving um, and activating lowrider history. Uh, I just want to give a quick shout out to everybody that's tuned in right now. Um, it does mean a lot to me that you're going to be spending this this next hour and to the Alumni Association for reaching out and and uh, giving me an opportunity and a little bit of a platform here. So yeah. thank you. Um, if you're active on social media, uh, you can go ahead and give me a follow or, or check out anything that I'm doing on Instagram at Tijuana Rick Art. And if you want to contact me after this presentation, lowriderartist at gmail or through my Santa Clara email, rcortez at scu.edu. Uh, so, you know, kind of briefly about myself, I am the director of marketing at Miller Center for Social Entrepreneurship, where I get to work with some amazing colleagues and support entrepreneurs all over the world with free programs to help them scale their business, um, to help uplift the communities that they work in, you know, like I said, all across the globe. Uh, so it's really a fulfilling job to have here on campus at this really unique center that I work in. I'm also their DEI champion uh, for this year. So that's that's really an honor that I get to have. I do support my local and am active in my local lowrider community. I'm a board member on the United Lowrider Council of San Jose, where my focus is on youth outreach and education. And I'm also a fine and practicing artist. Uh, and both of those skills actually come together from my education at Santa Clara and then pursuing my master's degree at San Jose State. Uh, so both of those kind of uh, paths coming together to, to kind of create my art career. But in order to understand kind of the, the focus of this talk, we've got to rewind a little bit, go back to, to 1980 and 1990, uh, those two decades there. And uh, this is me. You know, playing with some Play-Doh in the 1980s, a very curious, inquisitive kid uh, can make toys and board games out of scrap pieces of cardboard just to kind of pass the time. Um, and I think every kid is somewhat imaginative in that sense, right? 
Um, and then as we get older, things kind of change for, for every individual. But I was always into taking apart VCRs and old electronics just to see how they could work, uh, to kind of get an understanding of what was inside these things that seemed to work like magic, right? But there's a whole world inside of these things that I was looking at. Um, and then as I grew older, I, I really became in tune with my Chicano heritage and Chicano identity. And so here I am pictured with Luis Valdez, one of the sons of Pancho Villa. Um, I think we were at like a, a fundraiser out in Gilroy where there was a bunch of, a bunch of my Chicano idols there. Um, and so, you know, I have this, this, this dual kind of identity happening in the 80s and 90s where I'm growing up very inquisitive and, and trying to look into, to see how things work and use my imagination. And then I have this strong Chicano heritage that's starting to blend together. Mm -hmm. So here I am again, making, making something else, uh, a little bit older here. But my parents realized that I was really starting to be interested in what seemed to be concepts of engineering. And so they put me into this youth program, which brought kids from diverse backgrounds together at San Jose State. And it was uh, like an engineering camp, essentially um, year, year long. And so I get to meet kids from, from different regions of, of Santa Clara County and, and a little bit broader. Uh, we get to hear from guest speakers um, and it kind of just introduces us to concepts and like emerging things that were happening in engineering. Um, but along with that, I was very inspired by these two gentlemen right here, my grandfather. So my grandfather, Nicolas, on the left, who was an active member of the United Farm Workers Movement for a very long time. He was a union um, electrician. And so he gave me my first soldering kit, right? He gave me these kits of toys that it forced you to think, to be able to put them together, uh, to assemble them. And so he was always telling me to think outside of the box when it came to working with tools or if you were fixing a car. I inherited both of his cars. And so he was like, well, you need to figure it out. Um, here's a book for you to read. And my grandfather, Tomas, he's the reason why uh, I'm in San Jose. Uh, so after World War II, he established his family in East San Jose and he could make anything. Like if you, if I gave him an idea, I was like, hey, I want a, a slingshot. He would be able to, to design one up and, and build it for me in, in like a week or like a, a go-kart, right? That he would push around and I would steer it. Um, so both of these men here taught me how to create things with just my imagination and creating something out of nothing, just using your hands, using your skills um, and, and kind of taking that and moving that forward. So it's thanks to them that I, I really do get my creativity. But I also saw my, my uncle, Daniel, on here, who was a teatro campesino performer. And so I, I come from this long line of creative Chicanos um, that, that really have been influential in the stuff that I do today. So these are both of the cars that were my grandfather's, his work truck, and his family car. And so now I, I possess both of them, and I keep them on the road and, and get to cruise those around. So when I came to Santa Clara, I knew for sure I wanted to be an engineer. Um, and you, you said that in the intro, right? I was, uh, you know, I was ready to be a mechanical engineer. Um, you know, was still kind of solidifying my Chicano identity at the same time. Uh, went to the engineering program and had a really difficult time. Like, I was very surprised how hard it was for me to grasp the concepts of physics and math and work on these equations and functions to be able to figure things out. And my mind just could not do it. And so I started to get really poor grades for the first time in my life. And it was thanks to the bridge program, um, or they're called lead scholars now. Uh, one of the counselors was like, hey, you know, this isn't working out for you. So why don't you pivot and just go try a digital design class and see how that works out for you? Because there's, there's some alignment there in terms of the, you know, the design aspect, which I was really drawn to. And so I did. And, you know, I, I never looked back after that. And so this is one of the very first pieces that I created in that class. So it goes on, but but what's interesting about this piece is that this right here is like me encapsulated 
from being a child of the 80s, Nintendo and Super Mario are, are like the rage, right? And then I have this mixture of lowrider culture coming in. And so in this art class, and it's really thanks to the art department for those teachers pushing me to take my Chicano culture and identity as a source of inspiration for artwork uh, creating. And so like this, you see it right here, right? What would happen if I mix Mario and a lowrider together? Like, what does that narrative yeah. look like? Um, and so that, that's what was created here. And, you know, I was able to learn under some amazing teachers like Sam Hernandez, you know, rest in peace, uh, Mr. Chacon to, in Chicano Studies, uh, Pancho and, and Francisco Jimenez, um, and then my other professor, Marco Marquez, who they all taught me, like, elevate your Chicano identity through your artwork. And that was kind of a driving force, basically, until I graduated Santa Clara. So for the better part of 20 years, I've been, I've been creating Chicano art. Uh, this piece on the left was created here at Santa Clara, where I really learned a lot of different skill sets uh, to help manifest my Chicano, my Chicano roots. And San Jose State allowed me to find my voice and really understand with the tools that I have, where am I most passionate about creating artwork, right? And, and for me, it's, it's a lot of it's through sculpture, video, and sound. Um, and I'll, I'll get a little bit deeper into that in a few slides. But this piece was really cool because it allowed me to go and explore San Jose, where I interviewed a bunch of street vendors and I kind of started to dig into their life. Like, why are you in this line of work uh, as opposed to other lines of work? You know, what is it like to be a, a street vendor? What is this, how does the underground economy that you're working in function, right? For you to survive on the, you know, selling your, your goods. Um, and so I took those interviews, those voice recordings, and I created animations to kind of go along with the interviews, embedded them in this paleta cart. Um, so those screens that you see there are video screens that would transition from a sticker kind of graphic into the actual video. And there's a speaker inside and it kind of emanates out uh, the story of, of each one of the vendors. You know, and then and aside from that, I when my wife and I found out we were going to have a daughter, uh, I knew that I wanted to create something customized for her. And I was like, okay, I'm going to make a Power Wheels lowrider for her. Started to do some searching and that doesn't exist. And so, but the market is there for that, right? There's Chicanos having kids all the time, right? <laughs> Lowriders are having kids all the time. So why not have uh, a car that they can drive at car shows with their parents? And so this is what I created for my daughter. So what this is, is, is a, a movable interactive art piece, right? And on wheels where, that my daughter can sit in it. I can control it with a remote control that I programmed. And so a lot of the skills that I learned at Santa Clara and San Jose State allowed me to be able to create this, this brand new invention, right? Through the use of emerging technology and still kind of going back to my engineering roots of trying to figure out how do I make, a, how do I make this thing work? Um, and so that, that was cool to, to drive her around in. And kind of where I focus a lot of my attention now is working with uh, commission work. And so this right here is an interactive light that is sound reactive. And so when you play music or you, 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 know, you can, any kind of ambient noise will cause the lights to, to bounce and dance around to different frequencies and sound. And so this is a really popular object in the 70s. Um, and I'm kind of just reimagining, remixing the identity of these things for businesses and, you know, individuals that, that want a customized um, artwork in their house that reacts to music. So that, that was kind of me in a nutshell, uh, but in terms of my Chicano culture and the way that I like to use it for good essentially is in these three phases. So I have a discovery phase, a preservation phase, and an activation phase of, of my Chicano identity. Um, so the discovery phase. So it wasn't until I was in my 30s that I realized that I have this, this lifelong thread of low writing um, that I didn't realize was there. But then as I started to look at my journey, it's like the dots are connecting, right? And it's leading me to where I am now, right? We're sitting with like these posters back here that I'm able to educate kids on, uh, which, which I'll get to in a few slides. But here I am at 12 years old. My parents gifted me this 
remote control, you know, model car, low rider. You know, in the 90s, it was that from Radio Shack. But I, I wasn't born into the low rider lifestyle at all. Uh, I was actually nurtured into the low rider lifestyle. Uh, so my parents saw that I was really interested in these model cars, these low rider model cars, and making them pop. And the school that I went to, one of my best friends over there, Bobby Laguna, he would bring these cars to school and he would say, hey, check this out. Like, look at how this thing hops. And he was hacking them and modifying them so that they would have more power and they could jump higher. And the paint jobs were getting crazier. And I was completely obsessed with this and wanted to learn everything about it. And my parents saw that. And so they, they supported that rather than kind of be an obstacle or, or make me shy away from this part of my culture, they, they educated me on it, right? And so my dad bought me my first uh, low rider print magazine, which was a street low magazine. He gave me his CD that he had, which was War, Best of War. And it had the song Low Rider on there. And I was blown away that there was actually a song about this culture, right? Or this lifestyle. And I mean, what did I know? I was like 12 years old. Um, I didn't know anything about the history of low riding. I just knew that it was cool. <laughs> and um, and then my mom had this book in her closet and she said, you know, you should, you should read this. You should check this out. And it had everything from Pachuco culture and, and, you know, that type of car style to indigenous roots and, you know, moving forward to Chicano artwork and the Chicano movimiento. And, and so all of this was starting to, to kind of collide together for me, right? The model cars, the low riders, the, the Chicano heritage that was really strong in my family that I was just starting to appreciate and want to learn more about. Uh, so that nurturing part was, was really key to, to my exploration into low rider culture. And so that started to come out in a lot of the sketches and artwork that I started to produce, you know, when I was in high school. Um, so kind of this, this kind of stuff here. So moving into the, into the preservation phase of, of my Chicano identity. Uh, and this is kind of where Jesuit values start to come in, right? And I don't really talk about this overtly in the workshops that I do, but, but it's there, right? So for me, I think it's important to be able to educate others so that they can have agency over their own path in life, right? Uh, but a big part of that is having access to that education. And for me, um, a lot of lowrider material is not accessible to people. And so here's an example. So if you wanted to read a Teen Angels magazine number one, you would have to spend $3,000 to buy the first issue just to be able to flip through those pages and see what was this magazine all about. Um, if you wanted to read the first issue of Lowrider magazine and see, you know, what, what, was, what is this, uh, this magazine all about? What are they writing about in 1977? Like they're selling it for $11,000. That's crazy. What 14 year old has $11,000? to be able to have access to this education, to this knowledge. So in 2020, during the pandemic, I, by that time, I already had a, a good collection of lowrider print material, a lot of rare material. And I started to scan it, digitize it, and upload it for free on the name of open access education uh, of this culture to lowriderfever.com. So you can go there right now. Um, you know, Not everything is lowrider related, like Gonzalo's Magazine is a very crucial uh, turning point in, in Chicano literature. It was like one of the first Chicano magazines to come out. So I have a few issues of Gonzalo's on there. Uh, but you can see what, what were they writing about back then, right? What was the evolution of lowrider culture? Um, when lowrider movies were coming out, what were people saying about it? It was all written in these magazines, right? On top of the artistic component too, uh, because the art styles change from year to year, the layouts change, the graphic design changes. Um, so for me, that's that's a really cool thing to look at, right? It's like, how were they thinking in terms of design, but also the state of the Chicano and lowrider culture in, at that particular year when they were writing that issue. Um, so that, that's all there for free for people to read. And along with that was starting, is starting to record our oral histories and our oral traditions of lowrider culture. So there's, there's a really good podcast right now called Drifting on Memories that chronicles lowrider culture in Los Angeles. And so this, this guy, Raul, is going actively going out and puts a podcast out right every couple of weeks, uh, talking to some original person from the 70s and, and about their car club and their stance on low riding and how that, that idea came out. And I took direct inspiration from that and started to do that with San Jose low rider culture and learned a lot of cool, cool facts and, and history. And here's a cool fact about low rider culture that a lot of people don't know that this is the artist that created the Lowrider logo. It was from San Jose. And so here, 
Here's his clip. When uh, the first year of the magazine came out in 1977, and, and then in, uh, and I think it was in July issue, they, they put out the, the back cover for the poster. After that, I started looking at the magazine more, and, and, and each cover in the first issue, the second issue, and the third issues, you know, the, the design just kind of started shifting, and, 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 and the, the lettering that they had for Lowrider there was, you know, the Cholo, you know, style of, of writing and stuff back then. I don't know what they call it these days, but anyway, graffiti art. <laughs> and so I looked at that and I go, wow, I should redo that. And so I started looking at the little emblem they had on there to indicate how much the magazine costs, you know, and they had a list, they had a little, they just with a felt pen, just drew a line and threw a hat and, and said one bola. <laughs> and they had the dollar sign on it. And I looked at it and I go, wow, I, got, I should redo that. And sure enough, I just refined it, made it more modern and with the hat and glasses mustache and Laura just really dug it they just like wow this is cool this is we want to put this in there so it hit, it hit the cover uh as the magazine evolved they they changed the lowrider logo to old english and i looked at that and i go well i can make that better so i did i redid the logo for lowrider and it was the old english with the with the lowrider logo on it and it, it, I think it was got published for about a year, you know, using that logo and emblem. And all of a sudden, the logo just started popping up all over the magazine and inside the magazine. And that same year, they had the first car show, so that was at the fairgrounds. So that was that was pretty cool. So I was able to create the poster for that. And so I just kept rolling pen and ink. <laughs> uh, I didn't get into airbrushing until later on, but but I was trying to get this out on on my board and and just share as much as I could. So it was exciting, actually. So I'll make a lot of these little vignettes of of the interview and then the full interviews on on YouTube for you to listen to. But just getting these oral histories and understanding these traditions as these are facts, right? These are straight from the people that were there. That we don't have. A whole lot of time to get these stories and so it's important for us to collect that so that we understand our history and the true history rather than hearing it later on as hearsay or uh, history that, that isn't accurate right and so that, that's why I, I see this this new endeavor that i'm doing is pretty it's pretty important especially for the for our lowrider community um so now we'll get into the the activation phase of of lowrider culture and chicano community from from my perspective um, and this is where I get to work with and for others, right? Another Jesuit value. My parents always taught me that it's important to give back to your community. My grandfathers were giving back to their community in their ways, right? Whether it was serving in World War II or helping the farm workers. Um, my uncles, you know, standing in the picket lines and in service of, of rights for those that didn't have rights. And so for me, giving back is, I'm doing it from, I'm doing it my way, right? Um, and so I, what I was able to do is, receive a grant from the city of San Jose as a creative ambassador. And I use low writing as a way to, to bring people together with artwork and combining that with technology. And so I created uh, for that year, San Jose Steam Buen Estilo, so science, technology, engineering, art, and math with style. And what we did is we learned concepts of low writer history, art history, color bar history, which I'm, I'll talk about in a second, technology and electronics, and using our cultural imaginations to create unique artwork to every individual that came into that workshop. And I usually started off with this quote, nobody ever invented something that wasn't imagined first, right? Uh, imagination is key pretty much for everything, right? Like even, the, even Zoom that we're using, somebody had to have that idea and imagine what if we were able to connect multiple people together on, on screen through you know, the video cameras that are on our, in our computers? Um, someone has to imagine that and design it, and then it moves into production and engineering and, and coding and all of that, right? But imagination is the first step. So if you don't know what a color bar is, this is an example of what, the, what a color bar is. <laughs> see here is a, is a device that goes in your car, your classic car that wires to your speaker system. And the, the sound that's coming into this, this color bar is causing the lights to react to different frequencies of sound. And so as you're driving, it's like you have this, 
interactive living light show that's going to the rhythm of your music. It's, it's really cool. It's a very popular accessory for low riders. Uh, but it also had a lot of different form factors in the 70s and 80s at like the peak of its popularity. Um, and so these units here, you would actually have in your house kind of near your sound system. And you would just watch this light show happen as you were playing your music. But the concept or the idea of mixing sound and light together, it's been around for a long time. So I'll, I'll let y'all guess on Zoom, but you know, would you think that these have been around since the 70s, maybe the 60s, maybe in the 1930s, the first movies were coming out? Um, if you guess that they were actually 300 years old, then <laughs> the concept has been around for a really long time where this mathematician invented this instrument that as you would play the chords of this, this harp score, this piano type instrument, there were these painted pieces of glass and then candles behind each one of the panes. And in between those, there was little shutters that would open and close that were mechanically controlled through the chords that he was playing on his instrument. So it's the same concept, right? Where the sound is, is syncing up with the lights and, and this visual display of, of the music. And so that's what I was, that was the premise of tying in the STEAM education um, for the workshops that I was doing. So here's a quick snapshot of what happened in the workshops. So these workshops were held in, in the heart of downtown. Uh, Google, a representative from Google saw that I was looking for a space and gave me this, this nice space downtown. We were able to hold these workshops in a classroom type of setting. And so the, the premise was to teach adults and kids to bring them together and learn art and STEAM education framed around um, low writing as the theme, right? And so everything that they got, like I, I made these little kits for every, every participant that came through. I even designed the circuit boards to look like a lowrider. You know, there's messages of positivity on there that you're an artist uh, as soon as you walk in this door, right? That you're going to create something from scratch, basically. And so they, they put everything together, right? They understood all of the, the electronic components. We walked through what each piece did, um, helped them assemble it all together. You know, you have a dad and the son uh, kind of putting all of the, the lights together in that that photo over there on the right. And everyone received a packet of photos that they could cut up and remix and glue together and turn into their own compositions. And what started to happen is that people were, were gravitating towards certain images that related to their own personal narratives, their own personal journeys. A lot of, you know, some people were telling stories through the photos. Some people have had like religious ties to some of the images or talking about their all girl car club right, and kind of creating those, those compositions. And so we took their, their artwork, turned them into transparencies, and affixed them into the, the light enclosure. And so once the light circuit was built, we put that into the enclosure, and then the, the, their artwork gets illuminated by the circuit that they just completed. Um, and so, you know, they get their composition, and, and at the end of four hours, they walk away with a art piece that's unique to them in their own story. Um, it was really cool. And so along with the collaging, I was able to take an opportunity to teach them about art history. And so this is one of the examples I showed them. The Dada art movement started the collage movement back in the 1920s. And you know, here we are 100 years later, still creating collage artwork, but with a, a lowrider twist. But lowriders have been using collage work for forever too. And, you know, and so showing them examples of in the 1970s, how some magazines would take photos of people and paste them together to make these really cool, unique layouts that are now iconic layouts, right? People copy these things now. But back then, 
you know, they were experimenting with print and trying to figure out how to get their magazine to get as many photos as they could at once, uh, but still creating these really unique and iconic type of uh, designs. And even lowriders themselves on the cars are using photos as part of their, their artwork on the car itself in between the paint. So that last one was Michael Jackson. This is all an Elvis Presley car. Um, and then here they are kind of at the end of the workshop in this frame, picture frame that I created for them to kind of show off their artwork and be proud of the stuff that they created. And had all walks of life come through, you know, grandparents with grandkids, um, aunts and uncles, people that knew nothing about low writing came to just experience this workshop because they saw value in the technology part of it. Um, and then I, you know, had an opportunity to introduce somebody new to, to the lowrider culture, right, which is a, an amazing tradition we have in, in the United States. Um, and then at the very end of the 10 workshops, we had a car show party to show off all of the student artwork. Um, so there was about 60, 65 panels that were completed. And so I was able to show those off, invited the community out to come check it out. So it was a big celebration, DJs, uh, lowriders came out bunch of kids, which was like the best thing ever to have kids kind of just running around. Uh, so I'll show a quick one minute clip. So it was really something unique for San Jose to be able to have a, a, an event like that where you're showcasing the work of, of kids that have come through this, this workshop and to see their like faces light up when they see it all kind of put together, right? Uh, it, was, it, was, it was really, really cool. Um, you know, and then taking the opportunity as well to, to not just talk about lowriders and lowrider art in the traditional sense. So when you think about lowrider artwork, um, you kind of think about traditional forms of art, like uh, painting or drawing or pen and ink, when, when you think of lowrider art. Uh, but you don't really think beyond this for the lowrider culture. And so get, taking this opportunity to show them, you know, there's the world of art is so vast that what you're making right now is so new, right? But let's take a look at other examples. And so I would show them, you know, what if you thought about having a lowrider be almost like a comic book spread? Right? What would that look like? And so here's an example. Um, what if we take different parts of our culture and mix it together, like piñatas and low riding? What, what does that look like? What can you make? And, you know, here's an artist already doing that. Um, changing our point of view of observing the low rider. So rather than looking at the car from the outside, what is it to be inside the car? And what do you, you know, what does the dashboard look like? And how does that reflect in the artwork? We're taking things that have no business being lowriders and turning them into lowriders, right? So a barbecue with a lowrider paint aesthetic, uh, making a table out of a lowrider bike. Um, this car here is made out of two car, or this table is made out of two car fenders, um, and it raises up and down to fit different types of people, right? Um, but then that's also kind of reminiscent of hydraulics going up and down, right? So it has a utilitarian type of aspect to it, which is which is really cool. Um, you know, and so so then I would get into the lowrider history component because that actually is about educating the, the whole person, right? And kind of just tying everything together. So right now we'll go into a quick lowrider history lesson for uh, just for the San Jose region. Uh, but the, the cool thing about San Jose is that we produced the very first lowrider print material. Uh, all came from San Jose. So lowrider magazines headquarters was in San Jose. And then there's these two other magazines and there's, there's probably about six or seven magazines around the same time that started to spread across the country and eventually globally, telling people what low writing was all about, what was happening in these different cities. This was the social media of the time, right? Where you could actually communicate with people by writing dedications to the magazine. Then when it came out the next month, 
like the person could buy that issue in a different state and read the dedication, right? So there is forms of communication, forms of showing people what was happening in different locations you know, from the previous month or recaps of events. And so it's thanks to San Jose and the people that were, you know, the founders of, of Lowrider Magazine went to San Jose State, so, you know, just up the street. Um, it, it's thanks to them that Lowriding really spread visually and um, to, to the entire globe. You know, Story and King is a huge lowriding cruising, or was a, a huge lowriding cruising spot. Um, when Whittier Boulevard closed down in LA, San Jose became the number one spot for cruising. And so if you can imagine just thousands and thousands of people at, at this intersection, just showing off their cars, you know, partying, filling up parking lots with music. You know, there was a disco at one of the corners. So people were going to the nightclub and then coming out and seeing just this like car show on the street, right? It was, uh, it, it was probably pretty crazy. I, I mean, I wasn't there, but it, you uh, and the pictures and the stories I hear, it just sounds amazing. Um, you know, San Jose was the, the very first place to have the first shop that you could walk into and you can buy a hydraulic kit. So the commercialization of hydraulic components where I could walk in, pay 350 bucks, get my entire setup, and I could go home and install it. The same people that opened up that shop were the same folks that were able to stand the first car on back bumper, which is this photo here. So it's it's literally standing still with its wheels in the air is the first time anybody had ever seen it happened here in San Jose. And those same, those same guys actually were the first people to flip over a car with the power of hydraulics a few years later. So innovations in car hopping, you know, we think of cars hopping up and down, um, you know, it's really easy to get them high, that high now, you know, comparatively to how it was in the seventies. Uh, but it all started here, you know, in terms of the, the evolution of really powerful hydraulics. Um, and so here's another one of those vignettes of an interview that I did that was actually describing that very moment. So I'll play that. I took my position. I'm always on the front end of the car watching the front end. And uh, Manny's on the side with the stick because he's measuring. The, that was his position. And we, we were doing it and, and the car would go up and it was the highest anybody have ever seen. And so we started going and he started going a little bit and he pulled the bumper just enough so it goes just a little bit higher. And then he let it fall back down. Because you can't do it, and, you know. People are yelling. And he goes, "Okay, everybody, stand back!" You know, he's he's pushing it, he's pushing it, and he's he's pumping his everybody all up. And he goes, "Okay, everybody, count!" And he started counting. <laughs> it just stood there like that. That crowd started going nuts. They freaked out. It, it was one of the best shows I ever I ever had experience at. San Jose was the first place to have the the first formal lowrider, national lowrider car show. Uh, happened here at the fairgrounds. And then the next year they went to LA in, in 79 and had a, a bigger show. Uh, but this was the kind of the birth, birthplace of a national lowrider car show. Teen Angel. Uh, so if you look at old lowrider magazines, you'll see this artist named Teen Angel a lot. And he was kind of discovered by lowrider magazine. Uh, he was a muralist. Uh, I think he came from the Midwest and then eventually made it over to, to the West Coast. Uh, Loretta Magazine picked him up and he just created this iconic style of capturing lowrider culture through these like caricatures that he would make. Um, and so there's like a huge amount of, of his illustrations and all over the place are highly collectible, um, but it's a very unique and iconic style that was developed basically for that magazine. And you know, it was all thanks to Loretta Magazine, San Jose and Teen Angel for, for creating that. Now the, the woman over here on, on the right of this photo, um, she created the template for car shows as we know them today. So the way that we go to car shows and we see that there's concerts that happen, there's categories for competition in terms of, you know, your low riders competing for best paint job or best upholstery or best hydraulic setup um, or having multiple events during a weekend or a cruise uh, leading up to the car show it was all started by her. Um, you know, out of San Jose. And, and so she really created the framework and the template for these massive lowrider shows that were, that are, you know, commonplace now. Uh, but she, you know, it's written about in a lot of magazines that her shows were the best shows to go to. Um, so it's kind of cool that, that she's from San Jose. And finally, I, I always like to kind of close with this, that we all know who these, these two guys are here. Um, Steve Jobs, Steve Wozniak. So in 1974, 75, they're, creating the first Apple computer 
in this small garage, right, in Los Altos. And the exact same year, 74, 75, this red lowrider pulls into this garage off of Story and King and turns into this car, right? And so the reason I like to bring up this comparison is that at the same time that personal computing and technology was evolving in Silicon Valley, so was lowrider culture. It, it was changing at the almost at the exact same rate in lockstep, right? And eventually, from the same locations, that that culture would eventually spread out and change the entire world, right? Um, so I, I always like to talk about how Silicon Valley isn't just the capital of technology, it's also the capital of lowrider innovation. Um, I don't know that a lot of people realize that, but there's something really special and unique about the entrepreneurial spirit, the innovative spirit that's out here in Silicon Valley, that these amazing kind of life-changing, global-changing, culture-changing uh, movements happen, whether it's in technology or in car culture. It's, it's kind of crazy to, to, to have put, be able to see those happen at the same time. And just in case folks didn't know, but the... The artist who designed the final rendering for the Apple logo is actually a Chicano from San Jose State. Still lives in San Jose, uh, but I, I just think that's a cool little fact to put in there, right? Yeah. How embedded Chicano culture is and things where we might not think they're embedded in, right? <laughs> and so this is it right here. This this is what it's all about, right? It's the it's the young kids, it's the youth that are going to continue the tradition going forward. But it's really up to the older generation to teach them about the history to teach them about the possibilities of what their journey can look like through the embracing of whether it's their Chicano culture or their lowrider culture. Um, these kids well, from East San Jose, I was contacted by their teacher to, to teach them about lowrider culture. Um, and I said, well, let's also do like a little art workshop. And so I did this collage making workshop with them, taught them about lowriders. And you know now we have some some kids who might have never seen, never, never experienced a lowrider in their life now kind of know what, what it is. So when they see it, they can talk about it, right? Yeah. And they are now more familiar with lowriding than not. Um, and so that's that's how we continue the, the tradition going forward. Um, so a question I'll, I would leave with all of y'all is how can you activate your cultures for others? Right? How can you utilize your culture to maybe influence someone's path, right? To, to show them a different perspective or give them a different point of view of, you know, of something that's already out there, right? But from your perspective, and that can make all the difference for somebody, you know? Um, but yeah, that's it. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I'm ready for your questions or anyone's questions, but feel free to reach out whenever. Thank you, Ricardo. That was lovely. I thought I knew what you would present about because we've been planning for this event, right. but there were so many points that I had to, make sure I wasn't saying like, oh my gosh, like out loud too much. Yeah, yeah. Because it was still like surprising to hear a lot of those points that, you know, maybe I heard about it once, but mm -hmm. it's so impactful how you share it too. So thank, thank you. you. This is an amazing story, but also just your work and your passion really shows. So I'm sure everybody online can sense it, but being here sitting next to you, I feel that. So oh, thank, thank you. you. <laughs> Thanks for the opportunity again. Yeah, no, awesome. by all means, you're welcome here anytime. <laughs> well, let's go into questions. I see some might be up already. I'm going to stop sharing the screen and let's check our chat. I think Megan has been sharing a few links. If you want to drop any questions in the chat, you can do so. We'll be looking at the chat from here or feel free to unmute yourself as well. I can start with a question unless someone has. Oh, Laura. Yeah, I um, thank you so much, uh, Ricardo. I remember standing um, downtown on the corner of maybe, you know, Second Street and Santa Clara Street back in the late 70s and watching the hydraulics and all the fantastic cars go by. And then, of course, there was the, you know, 30 plus years of no cruising. Um, so do you see that kind of... Um, spectacle um in all of its glory coming back or is it already coming back yeah that's an interesting question because i was just talking about this earlier today with somebody else but it's almost like um uh, low riding goes through these periods of, of a renaissance like every decade or so where people are really interested and, and they love the culture and then it gets 
hit with a bunch of negativity. Then it comes back up in popularity, and then it gets hit with negativity again. Um, and so now I think we're we're kind of riding this 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 wave, this high point of of lowrider appreciation, this reawakening to the culture where it's being embraced by the city, uh, by local officials, and they you know are honoring now the the heritage that lowriding has had in San Jose. Uh, there's a, a bill in California that's currently being pushed through to remove the cruising ban statewide. And so when that happens, every city is going to be able to celebrate the culture and the contribution it, it gives to that local economy, right? Um, so yeah, I think we're at this high point and hopefully it stays high. You know, that would be great for people to be able to, to continue to appreciate the culture. Oh yeah, that's amazing. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That's a great question, Laura. Thank you. And I'm seeing some more in the chat. So from Alicia, tell us more about your children's book. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm gonna get too detailed <laughs> into it. Thanks, thanks, Mama. I appreciate it. Um, it's a it's a book that when I, when my daughter was born, uh, I was telling my wife that there's no children's books uh, on low writing for kids that teach them about low writing, right? Uh, and especially not like at the very young age, like the toddlers, where I'm already bringing her to car shows, right? And we do this all the time because we want to bring involve our kids in the culture. Um, but there's no literature on it. And so I started to think, and you know, I already have like five book ideas in my head of like what, what the series can look like, but it's basically an explanation of low rider culture uh, that you can read with a toddler, right? But it's also the way that it's gonna be illustrated is gonna be like a lot of the older generation would appreciate the way that it's illustrated because it, it really has like a throwback style to the seventies. Um, so there's a way to also bridge these like generational gaps through, through a book. But reading to a kid is like you're connecting and there's so many benefits obviously to, to reading right. to your child. So, so that's, the, uh, that's the inspiration behind the book. Well, you already have all of us ready to buy. Yeah, yeah, so. yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> <That was> good. <laughs> and from Jenny, I love the connections to your time at SEU and your Jesuit education. Thank you for sharing. And from Ashley, a very good question I also had in mind. Do you ever get busy in the low or dizzy in the low rider? <laughs> <laughs> dizzy? No, no, you don't get dizzy in the low rider. It's, uh, I mean, it, it, if you don't like smelling gasoline, then you probably don't want to be in the low rider. Classic cars are just like heavy on the fumes. So that might make you dizzy. But like the motion of the hydraulics, no, you, you're not constantly driving on the street, like bouncing. It's really for a short period of time. Um, because just the way that the, the the stress that it puts on the car, you know, and the, the hydraulics work off of batteries, so they don't run indefinitely. The batteries can run out of juice, um, so it's it's not like you can do it forever. But okay. yeah, I've never been busy. <laughs> awesome. And from Sharon, where did you go to high school? So I, I went to Bellarmine. My parents were able to to put me through through Bellarmine. So I'm Jesuit ed educated from high school college they also put me through college um but yeah i think that's why it's always been kind of ingrained in me that like what you do should also be done for others right mm -hmm. the work that you do um and so that's kind of like my way of giving back yeah love it well we know a lot of bellarmine folks who really represent that yeah yeah <laughs> a lot of bellarmine yeah. and leandra from one lead scholar to another how has the program helped you in your transition from first generation student to professional Felicidades y gracias. Yeah. Um, they were like the pivotal point of me being a failing engineer, a failed engineer to a thriving artist. Mm -hmm. right? Had I not had that conversation, I don't know. I don't know what I would have done. Right. I don't know what path I would have taken. I don't know where I would have ended up. Um, like it's all thanks to that. Right. And, you know, trying to explain that to my parents, like, well, I'm going to go to Santa Clara for an art degree now <laughs> because, you know, look at my grades and they're like, what is going on? Like, what are you doing? Um, that that's all that that's all that it took. Right. Mm -hmm. And. And also having that group of people that were from these this diverse background uh, that were backgrounds very similar to mine, you know, walking into that first meeting and seeing a bunch of faces that look like my face. Right. And had last names that sounded like my last name. Uh, was the support system that carried me all the way through uh, 
I mean, a lot of those people are my friends today. So um, lead has been fundamental in terms of not only getting me on the right path into the right direction, but also having that great support system uh, into my profession. Yeah. Awesome. And from Dan, what music is currently popular with the low writing public? I think everything. Yeah. I mean, I, I listen to kind of everything in the car. Everyone has their own style. But if you want to ask what music makes those color bars work the best, <laughs> I would say probably funk music <laughs> would be the best. You know, the, the better the system, the better those things are going to are going to be dancing yeah. in your car. Uh, but it, it really just kind of depends on on the vibe mm -hmm. that you're trying to have. You know, when I'm in my in my grandfather's pickup, I like to listen to more oldies, um, you know, even get into music from the 40s and 50s. When I'm in my 67 or my grandfather's 67, I listen to more funk music, um, sometimes some, you know, classic rock if I want to. Mm. I'm feeling crazy. Again. <laughs> depends yeah. the identity of the car and the owner then. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it definitely depends. Yeah. But everything kind of works. Huh. And from Alicia or Alicia, who is a current artist that inspires you? Current artist, that's a good question. Mm -hmm. um, you can say yourself. That's okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I try and find inspiration kind of from anywhere at this point. I think the access that social media gives you to see what other people are working on, not even in the in the artwork's final state, but you get to see the process. Uh, yeah. how people are thinking through the creation of their artwork. Uh, that's really inspiring to me. Um, an artist that I always look to, just because I'm, I really like combining technology with culture, is Nam Joon Pike, who is a Korean artist. He's not alive anymore, but I, I talk about him in the workshop to the students because I wanted to show them that, that the work that we're doing is actually inspired by someone from another culture. Mm -hmm. um, but the work that he did was so transformational for the art world where he started to bring TVs into the art world as his form of artwork. And so he was creating these TV sculptures, hacking the inside of TVs to make them almost look like they were creating 3D imagery uh -huh. even before 3D imagery was even invented, um, using neon lights and TVs together to, to tell the story of his childhood. Uh, he's really inspirational. So anytime I'm coming stuck on something, yeah. I can just look up some of his artwork and get re-inspired. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, I have a, my compadre too, he, Ruben, he went to, he's a Santa Clara alum. His artwork is really new. It's, it's new, it's unique. He uses gum, uh, Mexican gum, the mm -hmm. chiclets, to, to create these compositions that are uh, a cross between pixel art and, and sculptural work. And, you know, just the way that he kind of was able to break the mold of of a new type of artwork, yeah. a new medium almost, uh, is, is cool, you know, because it's hard to it's hard to find artwork that's new and, and different. Um, right. So he's doing that. That's amazing. <laughs> well, shout out Ruben. Might be here, might not be, but that's yeah, a good yeah. Shout out. <laughs> um, and from Margie, have you connected with La Raza Historical Society of Santa Clara County to integrate your work into their collection? You've collected a plethora of history that would be important to preserve. Thanks for sharing. Yeah, I, I believe they have an office at History Park or History San Jose, if, if it's the same organization that I'm thinking of. Um, I have reached out to them, however, I've not been successful at getting a hold of anybody. Yeah. Um, and, and I think it's a volunteer-ran organization, if I'm not mistaken. So um, I would love to connect with them. I, yeah. I think it'd be cool, you know, the fact that we have uh, a spot dedicated to, you know, Chicano culture. I mean, I think San Jose is beyond overdue for having a lowrider history museum, especially uh -huh. since a lot of it started here. Um, that would be a huge draw for people to come to this region, right? right. And help support the economy, the local economy. You know, it'd be great to have something like that happen. But yeah, I need to, I need to get a hold of them. Let's connect. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, and from Jenny, what's a favorite memory from your time at SEU? Oh man, that's a good one. <laughs> um, So if you were if you were at school at the time that I was at school, I actually had a a, a red lowrider bike that I would ride around. <laughs> so I, I ride like from uh -huh. class to class, or I take it to go to work. I used to work at the Wells Fargo on the corner over here, so I'd ride that to work. Uh, so that that was a cool memory of just kind of bringing that out and saying like, "Hey, here I am. Like yeah. this is this is what I'm about. It's pretty easy to tell like 
where my passions are, you know, yeah. just, by, just by looking at me. Um, but then I think also just being in the art department. So we were in the old art building where it was very industrial. It was dark. It was like dirty. There was sawdust everywhere. And I loved it, right? I loved going in there and kind of doing the digital side of artwork and then just going to the office next door and walking into his warehouse with all of his machinery and then starting to build sculptures. Um, so one of my, my favorite memories is kind of just being in there, creating, um, just working all night. You know, they didn't kick you out of those of those buildings. And so yeah. you could just be there all night long, just working on your stuff. And right. that was, yeah, I mean, I'll probably never get that back. You know, yeah. so that's that's something that, I, that was just truly awesome. Mm -hmm. Engineers might not sleep by the amount of homework that they get, yeah. but art students by far are the ones that I've heard spend the most time yeah. in the shop. So yeah. I hear it, yeah. <laughs> Uh, well, Margie said we can help with that, so we'll have to connect you to Okay, okay. <laughs> and low writing is not a crime from Daddy. That's right. That's right. <laughs> loud and clear. Say it louder. <laughs> oh. Support system. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thank you, family, for coming out. And from Denny again, thanks for sharing all that you did, Ricardo. Thank you. Thank you. I know we're at time, but if you do have more questions, you can make sure to email our Alumni Association email and we'll get them to Ricardo and share them with all of you as well. Um, and well, you can keep asking questions, but I know I wanna respect your evening as well. We're all ready for dinner and other things and other responsibilities, but um, I do wanna go over a few things if you're all able to stay on for a little bit, but I respect your time. Um, and well, to wrap up again, thank you. I know, you know, taking an extra time out of your day and being busy at the Miller Center already, yeah. it's hard to ask for another hour of your time. Yeah. And, you know, we've spent a lot more of just having a conversation about this program. So thank you. You've really been instrumental in just really shaping the way that I work also as an alum representative, oh, but cool. also being a lead scholar, this is something really, really personal to me. So thank you. Yeah, um, sure. And for everyone online as well, thanks for being here. I know this is a program that we were really looking forward to and we'll share the recording afterwards. So if you do want to share it with other folks who couldn't make it, um, we'll make sure to be able to do that as well. And as a reminder, too, after that, you, we will have more Bronco Expert Series available in the coming months. So please make sure to check the alumni event calendar and register for all and every event if you can. But of course, the Bronco Expert Series is more flexible that it is remote. And as well with connecting with Ricardo, we'll share the PowerPoint presentation, if you don't mind, so then folks can go back and also ways that you can contact him directly. So Margie, for sure, we want you to connect and anyone else who wants to just continue the conversation. You know, this is Ricardo's passion too, and he's busy, but I'm sure these are great conversations that we love to have as well and grow our community as well. And so we'll add in his Instagram, his YouTube website, and both of the emails that he has so you can get in contact with him. Thank you, Megan, for adding them to the chat. <laughs> Um, and again, I think we are super excited to continue with all of our programs at the alumni office. So there are other virtual resources, other recorded sessions that you can find at the alumni website under virtual resources. Um, there are recordings from our past Bronco expert series and yoga back in 2020 when we were all virtual and not in our offices. And um, there's a lot of great opportunities there as well. And Another great resource to get connected is Bronco Exchange. So if you are maybe a student or even an alum who wants to share their story or connect with you know, staff and being an alum with other students, you can connect through Bronco Exchange. And we are celebrating one year of Bronco Exchange this month. So it is a huge accomplishment for our office and for our community to be able to continue growing connections there. So make sure you create a account and connect with other people. That's for all of us. <laughs> um, well, if anyone has any other questions before we end, otherwise, thank you for being here. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Jenny, Megan. Thanks everyone who joined us today. Hi, Alicia. <laughs> <laughs> thank you both. That was great. Thanks for sharing. Yeah, thank you, Ricardo. That was awesome. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Okay. Bye -bye. Thanks for tuning in. <laughs> Thank you, Ricardo. Let the ammo.